Um, so I'm very, uh, on behalf of Laurence Descartes, uh, to whom I am uh, advisor for contemporary programs, I'm very grateful to Eric uh, de Chassé for inviting us here. I'm very grateful to um, everybody who has been uh, involved in the exhibition, and I see some of them here. Uh, and I'm very grateful to, to Glenn because it's been uh, an extraordinary journey, which I'm going to be very depressed to say ends tomorrow because Glenn's returning to, to New York tomorrow. Uh, but it's been a real privilege to be able to work on this and to see those names. Uh, I'm just going to show you, in case you haven't seen the work yet. I have no, I, mean, uh, I have no, how, how does this? Oh, oui, oh. oh. Ça marche comment? <laughs> c'est un ordinateur qui marche pas, donc c'est vraiment. Pas... <laughs> we'll just describe it really well. Okay. <laughs> so if you think of the names. <laughs> uh, Pardon. Yeah, yeah, like but uh, it's, it's, it's... <laughs> okay, so I'll just, uh, as we try to figure it out, I'll just say how, you know what, and I agree with, with Eric, I mean, the exhibition overall is a momentum in, in art history. It's also a momentum, oh, wow, genial. Okay, the flash, but it didn't work Okay, thank uh, So this is so uh, this is one viewpoint of the exhibition, of the work. Sorry, which is on two towers, and here are some details. And as you can see, you've if you've been to the Musée d'Orsay many times, you've never seen. That was when we just lit it up at 4 a.m. a couple a week ago. Um, and the Musée there has never been any such thing on the towers. And it's an amazing thing that the first time these towers are given for an installation by an, a living artist, it's such an incredible um, political conversation uh, and art conversation and human conversation. So as you see, these different pictures highlight some names. And here at the end, you have Lors, uh, named the name of the main in, in, um, in Olympia, which was at the center of Denise Morel's original research. And I'm very grateful to Anne Lafon, who has been on the scientific committee for the exhibition. And when we uh, talked about the fact that it was a really important thing to have Glenn's word in the framework of, in the context of the exhibition, that suggested that we all get together here under the auspices Join us pieces of Laurence Descartes for the Musée d'Orsay and Eric de Chassé for the NHR. So the way I think today might be structured tonight is that, uh, you know, I, if what we're going to do that we will have a first half of the conversation or maybe a third, which will focus on Glenn's project itself, trying to give you some content of how it worked out, how it started and how it evolved, and maybe how Glenn is feeling now that he's leaving us tomorrow. Uh, and, and then there will be a second half, which will, and that will be more something I will uh, interrogate you about. But of course, you know, I'm the, as I was uh, the uh, sandwich acquirer and assistant to Glenn for a couple of months. And, uh, and then Anne also has, has done a lot of work on uh, Glenn's work will ask uh, more questions about, especially a project uh, Glenn curated at the uh, Palooza Foundation in St. Louis, Missouri two years ago, and especially, and then a number of questions. And we will end with a sort of apex with I Am a Man, which is one of Glenn's, well, I mean, a, a work that is really a masterpiece of contemporary art, American art, modern and contemporary art, art period. Uh, and many other things. So I just wanted to, to start, Glenn, um, I just wanted to ask you how you feel to be in the same museum as Gauguin, <laughs> going back to our early encounters. Huh, that's interesting. Um, well, uh, first of all, thank you for the invitation to speak here, uh, to speak with Anne, which is a great honor. 
uh, and to speak with you, though we've been She's speaking for months. It's not a great honor anymore. You make very good sandwiches. Um, <laughs> <laughs> or you buy them, actually. Um, we were locked in the museum when we were doing the installation, so Donacien rescued us with sandwiches. Um, but, uh, you know, it's always interesting to work in a context that A, is, is not an American context. Um, so I knew from past visits that uh, D'Orsay is an important museum in France. It, it presents a kind of story of French art. And many of the projects here do not involve contemporary artists. So I knew that that was a special uh, kind of invitation that was being offered. Um, but I think what was interesting was it was being offered in relationship to a particular uh, exhibition. Um, and that was more interesting to me than just simply showing at the Orsay. I thought the dialogue between the ideas in that exhibition and my work uh, was something I wanted to explore. And you provided the platform to do that. Um, but it was really about thinking through this new scholarship on these black models and, and thinking through how I might make a piece that is in some sort of dialogue with that new scholarship. So. And you said that the invitation was also about you engaging the, re the interaction, the intersection between your work and what the exhibition was going to be about. So how can you elaborate a bit on that? Well, please? I think, you know, a lot of my work is text-based, both in paintings and the neon work. Uh, it starts with a response to a text, or it transforms a text, or it thinks through a text, or alludes to a text. And so when we first talked about the exhibition, which I'd seen at uh, Columbia University, the Wallach Galleries, uh, at the Wallach Gallery, the show was called uh, Posing Modernity and it was a smaller exhibition. Um, and so when I, you approached me about the idea of it being here and in the context of collection that uh, many of these works were already in, uh, but also in the, in the possibility of borrowing from the Louvre and various other institutions, um, you asked me, could I think of some project maybe that could you know, be in dialogue with the show. And I threw out, as one does, you know, first thought, maybe best thought, or just sometimes first thought. Uh, but the first thought was, oh, you have all this new scholarship around the names of the models, just put them up in lights. But not even thinking that that was a proposal, and suddenly it was a proposal. And so um, when I was offered this space, I realized that, um, okay, sometimes you just, not say things because <laughs> they, they actually come out into the world and get actualized. So, but it was an incredible opportunity to work on this scale. But working with these names, working with a text, you know. So I got very early access to the curators for the exhibition and some of the scholarship and documents around the exhibition, which was super helpful in thinking of the project. And um, so it sort of evolved from there. And talking about text, um, I mean, I think, what is the state, what is A, the source, even though you won't completely describe it, and B, the status of those texts? How do you deal with those texts that are in neon? What are they to you? Well, they are, and as I say, putting, putting names up in lights. I mean, maybe that's too an American of phrase, but it, it was this bout of gesture of a kind of new visibility. You know, I mean, the interesting thing about this exhibition is that many of the paintings in them are already known. They're the, you know, Manet's Olympia wasn't discovered last year. It's, it's been in the co collection for many, many decades. But the work around it, the scholarship around it is new. And so that was interesting. So suddenly Laura, who is the uh, figure of the maid in this painting, whose name I don't think I ever knew, though her name was known. So that's interesting to me, like, oh, I, I knew the name of the other person in the painting, who's, which I can't remember now. Victor uh, Mill. Okay, there you go. Um, but uh, Law's name, I don't know, was in my consciousness. And so I thought, well, that's very interesting that that figure of the black model in this painting 
There are only two people in that painting, but that figure of the black model remains sort of distant from me in some ways. Remained, uh, we were talking earlier about this notion of like blackness and allegory and how figures are often, black figures in these paintings are often read allegorically, but she has a name, Laura. She lived in a particular place. She was paid a certain amount for modeling. She was in other paintings. She's not an allegory. She's a real person. And so that was kind of the, the driving motivation about sort of using these names. But, but some of the names, because they come from models who were alive in the 19th century, uh, or because it was not important to art historians or the artists themselves to record the names of the models, remain unknown. So that's Namin Kamnu is part of, is a gesture towards that. But also in terms of signatures. So this is not, you know, if you look at the image of Lara's signature in the piece, uh, that is based on a historical document um, that had her name in it, but it's not her signature. Uh, Joseph uh, was based on his actual signature. He was a model that uh, worked for the Academy, the Academy of Beaux Arts. Yeah, and um, so at some point he signed his name in a ledger book, and so I thought it was important to use his name since it was available, his actual signature. But Laura, we didn't have the actual signature, so I used a historical document and copied that handwriting. But with other ones uh, where there wasn't an actual signature to work from or a name written out, uh, I asked friends to gave them the list of names of models that I was interested in and asked friends to write those names out for me and pick the ones that I thought would be rendered, you know, could be rendered in neon given the time frame that we had. <laughs> um, but also it was a sort of gesture towards the contemporary, but because I was talking to friends about this project and getting their ideas about it. And so I thought, well, they're already included in the sort of discussions I want to have around making the piece, so why don't I include their handwriting as a, this sort of bridge between past and present, you know? Um, and I think there's something else I'm really interested in and I know then that Anne also has questions about this work, so I don't want to ask all the questions at this moment, but it's one of the things that really strikes me as, um, you know, a person working at the Musée, Musée d'Orsay and walking through the museum several times every day is that, for me, you know, you turn these two towers of Guy Olenti's original architecture into a page. And there's a really interesting thing of how you make the museum itself a, a text. And which is interesting because it's both these extremely monumental stone walls becoming a page, of mm -hmm. a sheet mm -hmm. of paper. Mm -hmm. And it's also making, that's why you know, these pictures show different viewpoints, because every time you see those names from a different point of view, it means something else, you know, right here with the continents by Capo and the African woman literally in front. So I'm really interested in, you know, the way not only have you made these names legible by what will be, you know, at the Musée d'Orsay, hopefully over a million visitors, we will not necessarily will go see the exhibition, we will enter the museum and we'll see those names, but also how you've made the museum into the fabric of a text. That was, um, you know, I, I confess that uh, the idea of a page that occurred to me when I was thinking of the work, because it's, you know, imagine you go to a gallery and there's a visitor's book and you sign it, you know, and you sign it not necessarily, you know, on the grid, you just sign it. And so that's sort of the starting place, imagining that these names are, you know, signatures in a book. So that's where it started. But then it occurred to me that, oh, you have these two towers, and so they read you know, as pages, as, as, as books, mm -hmm. you know, as, as open pages, blank pages of a book. So that sort of came to me kind of as I was thinking through how to deal with this work compositionally because um, that was important to sort of like think through like how these two towers balanced each other and what names were on which tower, et cetera. Um, but it is sort of, um, 
yeah, it's a very simple format in a way, but then you have very to render. Yeah, but then you render it in you know neon at that scale, um, twenty meter high. Yeah, so it is the largest neon piece I've ever made in the least amount of time. <laughs> um, but I think the 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 subject matter of it, I think, has some dialogue with other things that I've worked with, thought about. Um, and I knew it, want, it could be in neon because of the fabricators I work with and their kind of enthusiasm for impossible things. <laughs> so it, it made sense to do it like this. Yeah. And I have another question, which is um, about the, the choice of the names and the fact that what is, I think is really striking is that the names are um, a combination of figures that are famous in our history, like Joseph, figures that are uh, famous in culture, you know, Josephine Baker, and even, um, you know, Alexandre Dumas in, in France, we didn't necessarily identify as black, even though at the time, you know, obviously all the caricatures that you will see in the museum describe as black. As black. Uh, and um, and also and figures that are just stage names. Miss Lala wasn't Miss Lala's name, mm -hmm. uh, and figures that are you know with identities ambiguous. Uh, you know La, La, Maria, for instance, mm -hmm. is it Maria Martinez, etc. So I think I'm really interested into how you deal with the different levels mm -hmm. of recognition of the names. Well, I thought it would be interesting to uh, you know to complicate the notion of a black Parisian, who is a black Parisian. So in some ways, uh, you know, that's why Josephine Baker is there, you know, uh, black American who became a black Parisian because of her embrace of this culture and the culture's embrace of her. Very well known, very recognizable name, so everybody knows that. Um, Alexandre Dumas I thought was super interesting because I, like many French people, as I assume, had forgotten he was black. <laughs> And then, but you can't forget it when you see the caricatures in the exhibition, because that, you know, caricature is about exaggeration, but it's very interesting in the exhibition to see him racialized as the point of caricature. That's where they start. So his, you know, perceived black features become exaggerated in the caricatures. And I thought that was super interesting. Um, but some things like uh, Madeleine, um, in the exhibition, the title of the painting has changed. Um, I'm not remembering the first title, but it was Portraits of a Negress. Mm -hmm. And then it becomes something else. Portrait de femme noire. Right, and then it becomes Portrait of Madeleine. And I asked one of the curators, when did it become Portrait of Madeleine? And they said, for this show. So super interesting that that is a kind of intervention in art history. Uh, that can be made by this new scholarship, but also a decision, you know, this is not the artist's title for this work. So to call it a portrait of a particular person whose name we know is quite something, actually. And also because it marks that painting from now on. You can't go back to the old titles now, now that it's been in an exhibition like this. And so, that was, um, you know, one of the reasons why I chose Madeleine because it's such a central figure, and Joseph just because he was in, you know, Raphael and the Medusa. He's in a lot of paintings from that period, and was very well known as, um, you know, a model and, you know, as a figure in French art history. And then others, others were, you know, just. I like their names, <laughs> you know, Miss Lala as a performer, fantastic name. No, we know her real name, but I was curious, you know, I think in the culture, like Chocolat is maybe still known as, you know, in the culture by that name. There are images of him uh, that are very well known. So it's sort of the stage name seemed to me appropriate to use rather than his real name. Maybe you want to ask some questions about the work, Anne? Uh, about the work, not really. Because oh, oh, then, then I can ask a couple more. No, 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 no. Let's, no, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Please. 
I but actually, I would love to have, before I have a couple more questions, but maybe before you go into the more uh, art historical and philosophical aspects of Glenn's work, but I wanted to ask you, you, you have been very involved and very, um, you know, very, very involved in the exhibition as a member of the scientific committee, the offer of two essays in the catalog, as somebody who has been involved in all the labels, and obviously as a very prominent art historian yourself. So how do you, how, what do you think of this? Right. Yeah, but <laughs> how could I say that in front of something else in front of Glenn Igon? I've been <laughs> admiring his work for a very long time now, and uh, I think what is really interesting to have in Paris because we had the chance to have him already in the exhibition in September at the mm. gallery. So it's uh, it's really we are very lucky to have uh, his intervention uh, in the museum. And what is symptomatic of his work? He, as he said, he has always been working or a lot working with uh, with the writing. And uh, I think there was something, and maybe it's something you, you did happen, you did make happen, uh, Donatien, uh, is to, to find the right artist, uh, and all, not all the black artists or the African-American artists could have done something so in correspondence, I would say, or, or addressing so well the exhibition, uh, the black model in uh, Musée d'Orsay. And I think the fact that the, the question of the archive is so important in, the, in the, the exhibition of the museum and also in the way Glenn is addressing history also in his work, it's very interesting to have it uh, this way. So that, that, that would be the, the best part of the of your work being here at this moment and addressing this specific show where the, the history founded on archive can be readdressed and, and, and even addressing the question of the history of black people in, in France. I think it's Donatien. I mean, I, 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 well, thank you for, for my part. But I mean, I think when, when we considered, when Laurence Descartes and, and I considered, you know, we never, like, it wasn't like we thought of um, who to invite. I mean, you were a miracle, Glenn. You know, you came, you came, because, <laughs> no, but you know, in a way, what happened? Oh, I see myself that way too, but <laughs> <laughs> I have a miracle, but. No, but I mean. Don't we, tell me more. <laughs> <laughs> no, but what happened is that when you came to visit the museum, actually on a, on a personal visit, because you were interested in the museum and its collection, and you spent, we spent a couple hours and, together, like two hours, three hours, uh, when you were doing your exhibition at Chantal's. And, and then there was a moment when, you know, we, we, was, we were installing Picasso, Bleu et Rose, and it was the moment, the museum was closed, and it was this moment when we were talking about what was coming next. And, you know, we talked about Le Modèle Noir, and immediately you were, um, you were uh, excited about the research and the scholarship and the fact that the names finally would be, would be available and would be not just available, would be public. And, um, and, that, and, and then, you know, I, and we immediately went to Laurence Descartes' office and said, there is a great idea. Uh, but, and, she, and it was her call to uh, obviously invite you and to give you this space, because I remember we talked about this, this moment of walking with her through the museum, you know, there is this conversation, but where should it be? The most public space of the museum, the only space that nobody cannot not see. And, and I think, how do you feel about this work being in the most public space of the museum? Well, I mean, it's actually it's super interesting because I've been in the museum a number of times and, uh, you know, at the openings, but today I was there today. And I, I, I disagree with you slightly. It is, um, actually a lot of people don't see it. <laughs> You know, even at the opening, people kept asking me, where's my work? And I would point to the giant <laughs> towers down there. So I found that really interesting. Yeah, I found it really interesting. But I think it's actually, it is in particular dialogue with the exhibition because the names themselves uh, sort of function as section labels mm -hmm. in the exhibition, which is not something I knew. So suddenly, you know, it's, Joseph, you know, it's not the name of the artist who painted Joseph, it's not the, you know, uh, yeah, yeah, it's not the section, you know, this artist, you know, it's a Joseph's section, it's Madeleine's section, and I found that a kind of nice correspondence to what I was doing in the work, uh, the neon work, and not something that I knew was going to happen, so that was actually quite nice. 
But the sort of like uh, highly visible invisibility, which I uh, thought, you know, uh, was the way that Laura in the Man is Empty was treated, is interesting in relationship to visitors' response to this piece, you know, that they stand under it, that they see it, but some of them clearly don't see it. And maybe it only becomes legible after they've gone through the exhibition and they understand what some of those names are, even though some of those names are quite well known. You know, Alexander Dumas, Josephine Baker, those are known names. But I found that, you know, maybe, I, and then again, I haven't really talked to anyone about this. It's just an observation. Yeah. And so where do you think is the best place to see your work from? Is there a best place to see your work from? No, Can and that, that is actually what's great about that site is that it's visible from many different vantage points. Um, it's hyper visible, but it's also visible for people who will never go in the exhibition, but they will see it coming out of any other galleries that they're going to be in or stand under it. And, you know, it's a presence. It's about presence, you know, and whether the presence is acknowledged or not acknowledge it is about you know part of the piece is about this sort of unmistakable presence that's either seen or not seen you know and how do you feel and i'll just say that will be my final question for my section uh because i know i know and there's a lot of but has many more questions to ask but how do you feel about the fact that um the names, you know, you talked about you talked about bringing them to the contemporaries through the rewriting, and how do you feel about the fact that those names have been, you arrange for them to be uh, appropriated by people, other people's writings, to be demultiplied, to be reinterpreted. Mm -hmm. So how do you feel about where those names are now? Now that you they are high, high, they are in the show, up in light. How do you feel about well, it? Well, but it's, you know, I think the exhibition uh, um, is about, you know, beginning a dialogue or highlighting new thinking about how to talk about this work in the mm -hmm. exhibition. And so I don't think of just my piece as kind of like, okay, now we're, we've arrived and there's nothing more to say because the names are in light. It's about a kind of conversation you know, yeah. an unfinished conversation, basically, uh, which is art history, you know, yeah. the, the fact that new scholarship is being written, people will reinterpret these works again in another generation, you know, that's, that's what art history is, it's this unfinished conversation. So this piece is just part of that somehow. Okay, thank you. That's, that's my, that, then I, I hand over the word to Anne. Thank you, Nessia. No, I wanted to go on with uh, the question of writing and uh, also of labels and how you name um, arts or work of art, works of art. Because you have been uh, working with the Pulitzer Arts Foundation, where mm -hmm. you have been uh, curating an exhibition in St. Louis uh, last year or two years ago, I mm -hmm. see. So, blue, black. And it's very interesting because in this specific uh, place, I've never been there. I wish I could. I've only seen photographs mm -hmm. of your curating of the, the exhibition there. And it's, um, it's a place where there are no labels. Right. So they, right. they, they exhibit mm -hmm. the paintings or the works of art without giving any libel. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to hear you a little bit more about right. this experience confronting mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. with uh, the fact that you have been talking about the labels mm -hmm. in the Black Model exhibition. Mm -hmm. Also, what, what, what does label to the work of right. art or what right. Right. doesn't it do? Mm -hmm. I think, um, well, the Pulitzer Art Foundation is a private art foundation in St. Louis. Uh, founded by Please, excuse me which is the place where Josephine Baker is born is yes <laughs> exactly exactly uh, founded by the Pulitzer family of the Pulitzer Prize and all of that um, initially the building which is a Tadeo Ando building was meant to house their art collection and uh, the couple Joseph and Emily uh, Joseph died and Emily who was trained as an art historian actually worked at the fog believe at Harvard uh, decided to shift the program of the foundation to do uh, exhibitions 
but the building itself, maybe we can get the, yeah. The building itself um, has some permanent art installations in it. Uh, and you can see at the back, uh, we go back to the first image. Yes, uh, at the back of the space um, is this blue-black wall sculpture by Ellsworth Kelly, and that's permanently installed in the building. The building's about 10 years old. And so I was invited to do an exhibition of my work there. And when I kept visiting uh, over a couple, maybe over a year, went two or three times, I kept seeing this Ellsworth Kelly and kept thinking about its title, Blue Black. Um, and I just said, well, I'm sure, you know, if you just take those two words, blue and black, you could do a whole exhibition around how they appear in art. Um, but somebody must have done that, right? And they said, no, nobody's ever done that. But I said, well, that's an obvious exhibition. So instead of doing an exhibition of my work, why don't I do a curatorial project that's in dialogue with this Ellsworth Kelly piece? But it also had a, it's very interesting you said there are no labels, because I had a very strange experience every time I walked in the gallery and saw that work, uh, and particularly the first time I went to the Pulitzer, um, I had a, oral hallucination that uh, Louis Armstrong was singing, what did I do to be so black and blue? So, and so strong the first time that I thought somebody is playing it on a radio somewhere in the space. It was that strong. Um, but of course, you know, I, I started thinking like, oh, well, that's a hallucination, but that actually is an interesting way to think about this piece, not the way that Ellsworth Kelly would think about this wall sculpture entitled Blue Black, but how one might read or, or create a web around these ideas, around those two particular colors and how they play out in many different uh, kinds of artworks. So that's where the exhibition began. Um, but it's also interesting about the, you know, Pulitzer doesn't put labels next to the work because it's an idea of, you know, you experience the work and there are docents and things to talk with there, but it's about this kind of pure, in quotes, experience of the artwork. But no, <laughs> no experience of an artwork is pure in that way, you know, and so my sort of hallucination around Louis Armstrong made that work impure in some ways, or made that work complicated in an interesting way, which any viewer to an exhibition brings that, but it was so specific and strong to me, and I thought, oh, that's a really interesting place to start. Uh, but also, I don't know if, oh, we'll stay on that slide for a second. Also, one of the things about having no labels is that the exhibition design had to do a kind of work and so in the first room of the exhibition, which is what you see here, um, to be frank, I stole uh, an idea from a fantastic painter named uh, Lynette uh, Yai Domboake, who's a figurative painter. She's probably shown in Paris some, okay. um, based in the UK. Uh, does uh, images of black people, men and women, in their paintings, uh, she paints a painting a day, basically. So it's, it's you see a painting, it's been painted in one day. And they're not portraits in, in direct observation, they're composites of images she's seen or memories of people. So they're the sort of fictional images of black people. Um, but often in her exhibitions, she will pose the paintings, she'll place the paintings in a certain way that they're kind of glances between images. So uh, a portrait of man and he's looking this way and he's looking at another painting that has a figure who may be looking somewhere else. But there's this sort of very intentional dialogue of glances between the paintings in her exhibitions. and I. Was when I was setting up this room, I thought I want that to be at the front of the exhibition, this sort of exchange of glances. So, um, Carrie James Marshall's black policeman is looking at a, I don't know if we have an image of it, but of a Carrie Mae Weems photograph, blue black boy, uh, Simone Lee's portrait uh, called Dunham, actually, on um, um, the dancer. Um, 
Catherine Dunham? Yeah, Catherine Dunham, who's also from St. Louis, looking at the black policeman. And then on the right side of the screen is a Jack Whitten self-portrait. So it was about sort of in that first gallery, setting up these sort of glances across images of blackness, glancing at each other across from these different works. So that was the beginning of the show. And partially that was because it was located in St. Louis. And after, you know, Ferguson and after the sort of uh, turmoil of that moment, the ongoing turmoil of that moment, I thought it was good to, f up f to put up front this kind of, in a way, a community, <laughs> you know, or gesture towards this sort of community of glances between these works. Uh, so that was the first impulse, and I think that did come about because there wasn't a sort of wall labels or didactic text telling you this is what this room is about, you know, so I had to enact it, you know, with the works that were chosen specifically. What other images do we have there? So that's another room where that was really thinking about landscape and light. So a Chris Ophelia painting on the left and Augustine on the right. There was also um, a Mary Heilman painting that was had a landscape reference and a um, Susan Rothenberg too, that was a seascape. So it's sort of these various kinds of landscapes and seascapes sort of worked out in that room. And then um, Wade Guyton, Jack Whitten, uh, Miro, um, ab abstraction, and then uh, Derek Jarman's Blue. Just to think about like Blue being talked about, you know, because that film is so much about uh, the color and sort of these kind of variations, his descriptions of where it appears in nature, what it could mean, it's various, the, the mood of blue. And that was very informative in terms of thinking about the exhibition, yeah. And what was the reception of the exhibition? Did you... um, I think it was probably one of the most attended exhibitions that I've ever done. Um, the, the Pulitzer was very generous in terms of the curatorial project mm -hmm. because you know I'm not a curator and I use that to my advantage when I just played dumb where I just <laughs> saw you know I want that Chris Ophelia knowing very well that they're gonna have to ship it from London and it's gonna cost a fortune but I just played dumb <laughs> you know and they it made it and it happened you know it happened so that's working for private working with private foundations mm -hmm. who don't have to fundraise that's that was quite a special kind of situation. And also some of the, uh, I had access to the Pulitzer's personal collection. So like some of the things in there, the Miro and things were possible because they were lent by the Pulitzer family directly. Mm -hmm. So it was an amazing kind of. And did you write a catalog? There was a catalog. Okay. There was a text in it by Fred Moten. Okay. Uh, I wrote a sort of narrative around the show. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I had another question I wanted to share with the French audience because we don't have so much this kind of uh, issues in in France and also this kind of uh, discussion, as you say. It's about you have been, I don't know if you could say work, but uh, you have been positioning in a way in, in, in a current, can we say that, mm. which is called a uh, concept, which is called post-blackness. And we don't even have a blackness now, but I would like you to, to tell a bit more about this, right. this idea of post-blackness, and which is something you have been discussing a lot also with Thelma Golden right. from the Studio Museum of Art in Harlem. So please introduce us to, to this concept. Well, uh, you know, I'm, I'm an artist, and I, I just was actually listening to a talk that Thelma Golden, who's an old, old friend, we started we met each other maybe in 1989, something like that. Uh, she was a curator at the Whitney Museum and then uh, is now the director of the Studio Museum in Harlem. And Thelma and I have had a long dialogue about art and artists. And when she was putting together an exhibition, uh, I think it was called Freestyle, which was a, in a way a kind of, uh, 
uh, a biennial-like exhibition, but the mandate of the museum is to show artists of African and African-American descent. Um, it's located in New York on 125th Street. Um, so we're having a dialogue and sh about the artist that she was thinking of for that show, and uh, and I made a sort of very flippant comment. I said, "Oh, we want some more of your post-black children," um, and meaning that the artists that she was looking at were, uh, in her words, in a way, deeply investigating blackness, but not in ways that were recognizable to maybe to an earlier generation whose politics and um, imagery uh, were about a, a sort of, to be a little bit unfair, uh, very bounded fixed notions of what blackness is. And she was think, seeing in the work of these younger artists, also investigating blackness, but taking very, heterogeneous and very abstract in some cases, uh, takes on blackness, very idiosyncratic takes on blackness, um, mixing it with other kinds of investigations and not feeling any kind of uh, responsibility you know, to earlier generations who dealt with similar subject matter. And she was looking at artists like you know, Rashid Johnson or uh, Mark Bradford or um, Julie Moretto, you know, um, so think about their practices and think about that in terms of the relationship to this question of, you know, post black art. But what was very funny was I was, when I was listening to this talk that Thelma did at the Tate a couple of years ago. All the questions at the question and answer period said, okay, so, you know, do post black, you know, in post black art, is there a space for queer desire, you know? Or do post-black artists not want to be included in shows that are only of artists of color? So it was this funny moment where you realize a term that's very loose and has become a kind of orthodoxy, you know, that over many years has, there, as if there is such a thing or artists who call themselves post-black, which there is not. You know, so that's what's interesting about the term. It was really just a way to describe a feeling, something that was being seen in the studios and a way of investigating or making art, not to create that kind of another box, mm -hmm. basically, another sort of like way of doing things that had parameters around it that could not be you know, punctured. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But maybe it's the difference between the theorician of post-blackness and of the exactly. practitioners or right. artists. They don't want something to be labelized or mm -hmm. fixed mm -hmm. when it comes from artists. But when it comes to theorician, I think something has been um, durci, I don't know how you Hardened. Say, hardened mm -hmm. by, 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 by the fixity of the theory in a mm -hmm. way. So maybe it's something also which... Yeah, uh, I think it comes, yeah, exactly. It comes through people writing dissertations, <laughs> you know, and having to sort of dis explain what they mean in very kind of, in a way, too, too hardened yeah, a way, absolutely. you know. But uh, can, I, can I just ask mm -hmm. one question? But I think it's also something to go back and forward between this discussion, general discussion of your of concepts in their relation to your work and your views on them. It's also something you thought a lot about in, in relation to the Parisien Noir. How would they call themselves? How would Laure call herself? How would Jeanne Duval call herself? Well, the, yeah, that was a question when we had a curatorial meeting and uh, sort of uh, people around the table were sharing their research and showing me documents. And it was just a question because there's a lot of, uh, you know, Jean, Jean Duval, who had a, a relationship with Baudelaire, was mixed race, I guess. When we were, I don't know exactly. But they, the question around the table was, you know, the, I was seeing these documents, they were exp describing her, you know, negress, neg, whatever the words were. And I just asked, you know, well, what did she call herself? Mm. And it wasn't a question that could be answered at the table. And I thought, well, it's very interesting that we, is this the category? Is this, the documents don't exist? Is, 
was her voice not important? So we don't have a direct, you know, she didn't write a memoir, so we don't have what she called yes. herself, you know, what she imagined herself to be, in the way that we, you know, Alexandre Dumas, apparently, I don't remember the, exactly the story, but says to someone, I am black, like you, you know, I forgot who he's um, talking he to. Was, I think it's, it was when he, he was attending a show with Ira Altridge, uh, yeah. mm -hmm. which is an African-American um, actor who mm -hmm. came to Europe to, to make a career, and he was so, um, fueled, I would say, mm. by the show of this man. He saw him, I think, in Versailles, and he said, je suis un nègre moi aussi, or something like that, mm -hmm. standing out, but right. like something he's revealing, or right. he's feeling proud of, mm -hmm. suddenly. Yeah, also. which is very interesting, because my understanding of how he's dealt with as a French writer, mm. that that self-declaration has no place in that mm -hmm. almost mm -hmm. you know it's mm -hmm. sort of this interesting mm -hmm. um so um well mm -hmm. yes maybe may, maybe we can go to the i am a man <laughs> story which right. is one of the most famous i would say painting of uh, glenn ligon and it's, it's so interesting also to, to understand how the writing is um, becoming material and how um, the stratification, I would say, or the levels or the, of, uh, of the making uh, is in dialogue with mm. the original sign. I think he will, he will tell you what does it come from. Right. There was a march in Memphis um, in um, 68, it was sanitation workers, black sanitation workers striking for equal pay for, as their white counterparts. Um, they make this march uh, and they carry signs that say, I am a man. And it is the march that Martin Luther King has come to Memphis to support when he's assassinated. And so, um, I'd seen many, many images of those signs, uh, actually when I was a kid too, because they were in those, you know, kind of 100 years of black history or 200 years of those kinds of anthology books, these images, but I think I was too young to understand what it was um, representing, but I was always fascinated by it as an image of the sign itself, and it sort of just stayed with me as I started to make artworks. And I started out as an abstract painter, and at some point I realized that the, the language of abstraction, of abstract expressionism in particular, was not something that could hold the things that I was interested in, that could hold the ideas from the literature I was reading, from the discussions I was having. And so I had to find a new way to think through my painting practice to in include, insert these kinds of ideas from theoretical texts and essays and novels. And the way I thought to do that was to introduce text directly into it. So the I Am a Man painting came out of that impulse because it points to a particular kind of history. Um, it uh, is autobiographical in some sense because of the word I. <laughs> and a lot of the, I mean, it's, you know, a lot of the work that I was doing in that early period included texts that had the word I in it. So there was always this confusion about, you know, was the I me, the painter that's speaking, or the I from the text, and what, you know, who was actually speaking in the paintings. Um, and also because it was, you know, the, the, the sign, the original sign was in black and white, and I thought, well, that's a way to start. Introducing color outside of that was too difficult for me, so a lot of the early work was black and white. Um, but the, the thing about this painting, and it was made in 1989, I think, or 88, 89, is that it was painted over an existing abstract painting, because, you know, poor art students, you know, have to use the things that are around. Uh, painted with enamel sign paint and oil paint, and those two things don't really go together. So when I started painting, it, making this painting, it started cracking immediately. 
And several years, maybe 10 years later, um, I talked to a conservator friend about this painting. And he said, oh, let me do a condition report for you. And I said, what is that? And he said, oh, it's when we write down all the things that we would address to conserve the painting. Um, and I really loved that. Uh, and I made a set of prints based on this condition report that my conservator friend made for me. And I love the idea that this painting was changing kind of immediately. The moment I made it, it started changing because it started cracking and things like that. And it seemed to be, have some relationship to how we view history, you know, in terms of there's one, you know, a particular historical moment and it's read many ways, but there's a sort of dominant narrative of how it's read. And then that narrative changes over time where, where new generations start looking at it, rethinking about it. Would it make sense now to have a march with black men carrying signs that say, I am a man? But very interestingly, this sign has been adapted for other kinds of marches. So I saw recently, I think a year ago, there was a march in Washington big signs that said, carried by children, that said, I am a child, in the same format. And I thought, oh, it's so interesting mm -hmm. that that kind of circulation of an iconic image, it circulates out and then comes, comes back, back in a different form. So that's one of the things that I was interested in this painting, that it's sort of this unfinished, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's still in process, it's still kind of changing and cracking. It's, it's not stable or fixed, much like how we deal with history or deal with our interpretations. Thank you very much, Thank Blaine. you, thank you. <laughs> thank it's you great to much. have this conversation with you both. Um, I think does, I think we can take, maybe you, you all want to rush to the Musée d'Orsay, which is, <laughs> Late it's not. It's <laughs> open late tomorrow, so you want to be started and be at the door waiting to get in to see Glenn's piece. But if you have uh, questions, maybe Glenn, you'd be happy to take. Sure, sure, sure. So if there is one. I'll, I'll just. I'll do, I, there is I can one. go. I can go. No, no, she did. She did. Uh, oh, no, she did. No, she did. In plus, it's my copine. Yeah. <laughs> 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 on comprend pourquoi en fait. Can I have two questions? Can I have two questions? Okay. okay. Well, I was only going to ask one, but the last comment made me think of another. I am a man. I wondered if, it, you know, of course there was the abolitionist rhetorical question, am I not a man? So mm -hmm. I just wondered if you could comment on the relationship between this declarative performative act, mm -hmm. I am a man, in relation to the question. But my second question, mm -hmm. and this one I'm really mm -hmm. desperate. Um, I just learned for the first time that the previous show is called Possess Posing Modernity. And mm. as I went through your exhibition, I was thinking about Le Modèle Noir, and maybe you can answer too, Anne. The, the definite article, the, the black model. Uh, okay, I will you know, let Anne do that. Posing Modernity <laughs> seems right. to suggest an alternative story or history of modernism or something, but mm. Le Modèle Noir, the definitive article, was so... It was so fixed, mm -hmm. you know, essentializing, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Okay, so these are mm -hmm. my questions. Thank you. Well, I think, you know, I, it, it, it's unclear to me, though I know there's a, a scholar named Huey Copeland who's written about my work that that's, has done some work on the signs in relationship to my painting, but also their history. And I think there is uh, maybe not a direct relationship to am I not a man and a brother, but I think there is a there must have been people who were aware of that, you know, that statement in relationship to I am a man. But I think I am a man, you know, uh, at the time was in relationship to a specific set of historical circumstances, namely the black sanitation workers and the white sanitation workers were being paid different amounts for the same job. And so that I am a man is, am I not equal to my white counterpart to do the exact same job? And why, if I am equal to them, why aren't I paid the same? And so there was this, I think, a very specific reference, but of course it does have some, you know, direct relationship to notions of masculinity at that moment, you know? Um, but curiously enough, there was a march after, if I'm getting this history right, right after 
um, Martin Luther King's assassination, and there are women carrying signs that say, I'm a man, and they've added the W-O, which is fantastic. So even at the time, there was this kind of alteration of that sort of very declarative statement. You know. But maybe I'll let Anne deal with the change in titles. Yes, may, maybe if you don't mind, I will answer this question in French, because mm -hmm. uh, it's yeah, really yeah. A, str uh, a French question, or a question mm -hmm. of language. Mm -hmm. So I think I will, I will have to, and maybe I can try to translate it later to you, mm -hmm. but I'm well, not sure of my oh, English he'll, to say. He'll, he'll okay. translate. <laughs> okay, so I, I say it <laughs> yeah. in, in French. Alors, c'est tout à fait juste que la, 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 la version américaine était autour de donc, posing modernity, et que la question, de toute façon, dans le travail de Denise Morel, qui est donc la commissaire de la version américaine se tourne autour de euh, finalement faire une sorte de démonstration ce qui est le propre aussi d'une thèse qui est à la base de son travail euh, autour du fait que l'apparition même euh, de ces communautés noires dans le monde des arts visuels et, et des arts en général des beaux-arts à la fin du 19e siècle et au début du 20e siècle serait finalement un levier pour passer du côté de, de la modernité en quelque sorte donc ça c'est sa proposition c'est son hypothèse dans, dans son travail donc ça collait par parfaitement à, je dirais, à l'exposition américaine. Dans le cas de l'exposition française, euh, de mon point de vue, là, et je, je, je vois du coup les regards du musée d'Orsay, je me dis, bon, c'est ma version de, 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 de la manière dont ça s'est fait. Euh, je dirais qu'il y a deux choses. Euh, la première chose, c'est qu'on a d'abord traduit The Black Model, qui était le titre de travail. C'était pendant très longtemps le titre de travail, le modèle noir, et tout le monde disait, ça ne va pas, ça ne marche pas, etc. Et le deuxième mouvement, je dirais, à l'initiative de cette exposition, c'était donc de la rendre, de la faire commencer beaucoup plus tôt, en fin de compte, autour de la première abolition de l'esclavage en 1794. Et de fait, euh, euh, la question de la modernité ne pouvait plus être centrale, puisqu'on n'était plus entre Manet et Matisse, mais vraiment euh, dès la fin du 19e siècle, enfin, on ne pouvait plus le poser de la même façon. Et par ailleurs, le modèle noir, moi, je trouvais ça aussi... Euh, peu satisfaisant, à la fois le singulier, à la fois euh, euh, toutes sortes de choses me semblaient insuffisantes dans un premier temps, mais le titre a tenu bon. Donc moi j'ai pensé qu'à la fin il fallait se poser la question à l'envers, c'est-à-dire pourquoi il tient bon et pourquoi finalement il fonctionne comme titre. Et je pense qu'il y a une raison, je pense que maintenant je l'assume très bien. D'une part le singulier euh, c'est le propre du discours sur l'art, on peut le critiquer, on peut le penser autrement, on peut le faire autrement, mais tel qu'il s'énonce en tout cas depuis le musée d'Orsay ou depuis le musée du Louvre, c'est toujours un singulier de majesté qui renvoie aux grandes catégories comme la peinture d'histoire, le portrait, etc. Donc il aurait été bien, euh, comment dire, suspect finalement que lorsque l'on adresse ça dans le cas des modèles noirs, on choisit un pluriel de, euh, qui, qui serait moins déterminant dans le registre du discours sulard tel qu'il s'est énoncé jusqu'à maintenant. Encore une fois, on peut le critiquer, mais c'est celui... Donc je trouvais que finalement, ça tenait la route. Et par ailleurs, la notion de modèle, euh, qui dans un premier temps me semblait euh, restrictive, s'est avérée une force et une manière quand même de se concentrer sur une chose et de ne pas faire semblant de traiter de toutes les présences noires euh, au 18e, 19e et 20e siècle, ce qui était un peu la tendance au début. Donc on s'est resserré autour de ce que fait de ce qui se passe dans un atelier quand il y a un artiste et un modèle, et souvent un modèle qui est un artiste lui-même, comme c'est le cas dans le cas des modèles noirs. Et donc finalement, je trouve que c'est assez juste, c'est ce que fait l'exposition. Et, euh, et, et ça inscrit finalement euh, la contribution euh, noire ou afrodescendante, si on veut être un peu plus moderne dans l'expression, euh, dans le registre esthétique et artistique. Donc je trouve que ça, je dirais, je, je l'assume tout à fait. Mais c'est le titre qui a tenu bon, et c'est nous qui avons dû ensuite réfléchir à sa, je dirais, à sa pertinence. Et alors dernière chose peut-être, bon là je m'étends un peu, mais euh, euh, bon je le dis quand même, euh, je trouvais que le modèle fonctionnait bien sur trois registres. Hein. Euh, le modèle c'est à la fois celui qui est le référent naturel dans la, euh, dans la peinture, c'est-à-dire que effectivement le 19e siècle avançant, les communautés noires de Paris sont de plus en plus importantes, donc on peut avoir 
des référents naturels, hein, des, des hommes et des femmes noirs qui servent de modèle. La deuxième chose, c'est la qualité exemplaire, c'est-à-dire penser le modèle, c'est aussi dire qu'on a euh, des, non seulement des professionnels, mais des personnalités exemplaires. C'est le cas de Joseph, qui fait partie des trois, euh, des trois euh, modèles professionnels employés par euh, l'École des Beaux-Arts, qui, et qui, comme, comme nous l'apprend d'ailleurs Isole Pludormareur dans son travail, c'est-à-dire qui sert aussi de modèle pour des figures blanches. Hein. Donc pour vous dire la notion d'exemplaire, et enfin, le modèle, ça comprend aussi la notion de réussir à mettre en place des normes qui vont être transmises et enseignées. Et effectivement, par le biais de, de Joseph et d'autres, on sait qu'il devient le moyen de, de reproduire, enfin, ça s'apprend de représenter un noir, en fin de compte. Donc tout ça justifie, je crois, si on regarde dans le détail, la persistance de ce titre-là pour cette exposition-là. C'est assez juste, c'est au plus juste, en tout cas. Et pardon de ne pas savoir dire ça en anglais. J'aimerais, mais I can't. No, that's good. No, that's I. That's being translated for me simultaneously. So that's fantastic. It's also um, just to add a little bit to the discussion we were having earlier about um, art history written through the you know viewpoint of the artist, through the viewpoint of the person who commissions the painting, and what would it mean then to write art history through the viewpoint, as you said, of the model, you know, what the models thought of it. And it's very interesting that you said it, and until now I hadn't really thought through this, but yes, yeah, some of the uh, models that some of the figures in these paintings are artists themselves. And so that's, a, I think, a kind of really interesting, you know, because some figure like Josephine Baker, for example, was very aware of her image and sort of Absolutely. styling, you know, and so what did it mean then to be posing for people doing her representations? That's a very interesting question. It's, it's a way to the collaboration. Mm -hmm. And the painting is a witness of the collaboration of two artists. And for mm -hmm. example, with Miss Lala already, mm -hmm. it's something you can feel that it was a proposal from Miss Lala to Degas, and not right. only right. Degas that arranges what she could do and mm -hmm. how it could uh, suit in, her, in his uh, position. So I think it, it's interesting to, to keep or to stick to this notion of model as mm -hmm. something which is not uh, a sitter. And you have two words in English for that. We don't. We always say model, but you have sitter mm -hmm. and you have model. And yeah. it's, oh, yes. And it's, <laughs> it's the yeah. point. We, yeah. In 18th yeah. century, I think we have sitters. And with Madeleine, we go to model, I think. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. through the, the 19th century, but it helps to try to say it in English, actually. Mm. Yeah, that's super interesting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Is there another, I think? Another question? Yeah. Um, my question is about the use of Madeleine in particular um, and the way that the title of the painting has changed institutionally and mm -hmm. whether some, it's something that you had hoped for, for example, that the Musée d'Orsay would then uh, call the painting now Portrait de Madeleine instead of Portrait d'une femme noire or Portrait d'une nagresse. And if there is uh, a part of the sort of institutional criti critique how the Musée d'Orsay might it's potentially... It's the Louvre. Sorry. It's the Louvre. Oh, at the Louvre, I'm sorry. How, how it could be uh, also construed as potentially whitewashing the period that is being uh, presented. Uh, how you feel about that, if that's how uh, an angle by which you're coming at this at all. Right. Uh, well, whitewashing is an interesting word. Um, um, but um, no, I think, you know, those decisions about the title of the painting were made long before I was asked to work on this project. So it, it, in fact, um, you know, I, that decision had been made already. But I found it really, what I found most interesting was that decision was apparent on the label. So the two other, the former titles of the painting are available to you, but now, so on the label it says Portrait of Madeleine, but the other titles are there. And I think that's a really smart way to get at this sort of like change, you know, in terms of like in, in, the way the institution deals with black subjectivity. Um, it's just a, it's a very big gesture and a very small gesture. But what I was saying that is, you know, important is that 
one has to, from now on, deal with that gesture. Even though the painting does not belong <laughs> to the Orsay, you know, what will it go back to at the Louvre? You know, it's like, what, what will they call it when it goes back? You know, it's super interesting. I saw, um, um, uh, I, what's the Delacroix? Uh, women, women, no, women of Algiers. Mm -hmm. And I was reading the, um, I just have to read it because it's too good, um, the, the, the wall label um, about that painting. And this is not a, you know, to say anything about the Louvre, but just it was interesting <laughs> to me to read it. Um, so, uh, visitors to the salon were uh, disconcerted by this non-narrative scene, an idealized memory of Delacroix's visit to Algiers two years earlier. The composition is founded on a colorful harmony of textiles, jewelry, and furniture, modulated by varying degrees of luminosity. It evokes a paradise that is both modern and timeless. So think about the painting, you know. <laughs> That's the wall label now, you know? And so I think one of the things that scholars like Anne and Donatien are trying to do is rethink those kinds of frameworks, you know? So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so my question was kind of the same, I think, and what was related it was just because I was also kind of. Um, surprised at learning that they had changed the name for the exposition itself. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to ask perhaps all of you, how come you take that decision and who has the power to take that decision and, and why, uh, why do you change titles of paintings like this? I'm sorry to say none of the three of us, but maybe Anne, but... Uh, Just, just a question of understanding, because if I right understood that there was no original label coming from the artist, that's a pro that's the main problem. So, no, you're right, because uh, it's not always like that. Artists give an art uh, in the beginning of the 19th century. Yeah. Fetishized. Mm. Mm. Uh, the, the name of the description of the painting in title uh. Yeah, but that justifi justifies the, the legitimacy of changing titles in this case. I mean, Absolutely. yeah, but I mean, I think it's as somebody who did his doctorate on titles, I'll just give one thing. Uh, so um, I think there are different questions here. I mean, there's one question which is. Um, you know, we know that the 1850s, which is in the middle of the show, is a moment when titles change. Like, for instance, with Courbet, who was a very early proponent of titles. But even um, the title of Olympia, for instance, we don't know. There's still, you know, it, Olympia is a title, is a figure that appears in a poem by Zachary Struc, which was published, which was presented next to the work in the catalog of the time. But we still don't know whether Olympia was titled because 
the figure in the poem by Zacharias Truc was t named Olympia, and because it was, and then, you know, Manet randomly asked his friend to write a poem, and then that actually connected, and then it was called for Olympia forever, or whether, you know, Manet had actually thought of Olympia, and even then the other idea, which is that Olympia is a nom de guerre, for uh, Victorine Meurent, who would be this and that. So even, you know, I agree with Emmanuel a bit, but then on the other hand, in the exhibitions, there are some extremely startling titles, such as the sculpture title, Pourquoi naître esclave? Why be born a slave? Which is a very extraordinary exception, why be born a slave? So it's actually a really interesting history, even in the way the time the, uh, the names and the titles evolve, how these titles in the 1840s, 1850s, starts appearing, and we see that to the show. I have one, maybe, if you allow me to ask a final question to Glenn. I just want... <laughs> then one more question, and then, and then you can ask as many as you want. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> but, but is this, uh, another question if you want. Okay. Be. I just have a question with, uh, regarding the relationship between blackness in the U.S. and blackness in France. What I mean by that is, at first, with many friends of ours, uh, of mine at least, um, black friends in Paris, were really surprised that we had noir in the title, considering that it's an entire debate in France, um, saying that we should actually use black because it's saying like le modèle le model black. So I would have expected for this exhibition to be called, for example, black models and actually uh, to keep on using the, the English name at least, or the American one. Um, and so from having seen the exhibition, I, I saw that there was this um, this goal of representing several uh, several blacks that are from the Caribbean, some that are actually originally born in France, others that were born in several African countries. So there's this idea of going for something that is a little bit much more uh, broader, much broader than, than France itself. And I wanted to know if this idea of Le Modèle Noir was about Le Modèle Noir in general from a French viewpoint because we're talking about French artists or was it also to talk about le modèle noir français and so considering that blackness in France in the UK or in the US totally different because of mm -hmm. history mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to know what kind of relationship you were making as an American artist uh, and art historian talking about French artists and French models mm. well I I can only speak as an artist in relationship to the piece. Um, that one of the things I was interested in was uh, this definition of what what is black. So um, we talked about it a little bit earlier, like how was Alexandre Dumas conceived of in France? You know, um, Josephine Baker ends up in France, and be it, but she's a black American. So I wanted to sort of put those names together to complicate this notion of what, what blackness means, you know, and think about it maybe more diasporically and globally than specifically focusing on its definition in France. But I didn't curate the show, so, so I guess that framework, you know, Anne and Donatien can talk more specifically about. At the beginning, we didn't have any uh, focus point, and we, we tried to, and I think it's a good way of making it, we, we try to find works of art, and, and to, to discover new ones which were not uh, exhibited with black people in it. And then we began to, to focus more specifically on the Parisian communities of black people and the artists, Les Saltimbanques, and from circus and performers and so on. So, um, because we could have had many more paintings, from, for, for example, from the Caribbean for in, in the beginning of the 19th century and through the, the 19th century, but it was not the idea. It was the idea of focusing on the relationship between the modern and the artists and also to understand the, the Parisian communities um, of artists and of uh, black people and how it was a central place uh, also uh, for, for, for example, for African or African-American artists to come to and have a career also. So it, it, it's, it's, um, it's mainly on 
Parisian artists and Parisian black figures, I would say. Some black Parisians. <laughs> Exactly. I think I can't ask a question like he after understood that. It. Quite, quite yeah. right. We have another question here. Wow. Well, thank you for coming. Thanks. Thank you. Glenn. Thank you, Pam. Good enough. The question after we go to some like Parisians.